Hello, and welcome to the AAMFT Podcast. Your all-access pass to the latest news developments and thought leaders in the world of systemic therapy. We strive to relate, educate, and innovate one episode at a time. I'm your host, Dr. Eli Karam, and we're brought to you by the American Association for Marriage and Family Therapy. Our podcast explores topics that relationship-based therapists care about. In addition to featuring unique conversations and interviews with established experts, our show provides information and education on direct practice and emerging trends in the MFT profession. For more information, please visit us at aamft.org. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. Eli, back with you on the AAMFT podcast. When we get into this field, it is great to work with individuals, couples, families that want to be there. But sometimes couples don't want to be there. And they're coming to you not to save the relationship. It's because the relationship is over. They have either been ordered or advised by somebody else that the way they're divorcing isn't really working. Maybe you didn't get into the field for that part of the work, but I guarantee you, if you were going to work with couples over the life course of your career as a couple and family therapist, working with divorcing couples goes with the territory. And who better to talk about that today than Dr. Jay LeBeau. He's a family psychologist slash family therapist who's a senior scholar in my old stomping grounds, a family institute at Northwestern University, where he's also a clinical professor at Northwestern and has served for the last several years as the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Family Process, one of the greatest family therapy journals in our field. He is a clinical fellow in AMFT. He's board certified by the American Board of Professional Psychology. Jay is known for his specific models for treating those involved in high-conflict divorce, which is the focus of our conversation today. The approach is outlined in his book, Treating the Difficult Divorce, a guide for therapists, which came out in 2019, and it applies an integrated family systems perspective to those having significant problems with this life transition. I am pleased to be joined on the AAMFT podcast today by actually a a mentor, a colleague, and all-around good guy, Dr. Jay LeBeau, who today is talking to us about one of his clinical interest areas, is working with divorcing couples, i.e. divorce therapy. And Jay, you might also know, I mean, do a podcast on his other major contributions to the field of couple and family therapy. Uh, He's also the current editor of Family Process, um, along with JMFT, one of our great journals in the field. But today we're talking about divorcing and working with couples, Jay. You know, it used to be in our field, if you could not save a a couple uh, and a relationship ended in divorce, that was a, a bad outcome. We do not think that way anymore at all. In fact, the field has has moved forward in many ways since you've been a part of. So before you tell us about the nuts and bolts of working with divorcing couples, how'd you even get interested in working kind of with high conflict divorcing couples? Well, this is an an interesting story. I work at a place uh, called the Family Institute at Northwestern. It is a very prominent uh, provider of mental health service in the Chicago area. And the judges in the Cook County system in about, nine, we're talking about now in, in the uh, early 1980s, were looking for somewhat of a better way than what had been the time-honored process of uh, people coming into court, having a terrible time with each other, and leaving extremely frustrated. And so they um, sought us out and began to send us various cases in which there was a a tremendous amount of conflict. Um, And what happens in those cases um, is uh, that it still happens. The judge can uh, lecture, which they often do, right? Judges have good ideas about what might be helpful. So they can lecture the divorcing couple about what might be helpful uh, judges have some extreme things they can do, like when there's conflict, there can be a, a trial, and at the end of the trial, 
the judge can rule for one side or the other about very important things like custody of children, division of assets, and whatever. But that's a pretty much the entire judge's toolkit. There isn't much the judge can do uh, uh, otherwise. So uh, so the judges, as I said, in, in Chicago, this was also true in other parts of the country, began to see, seek out coordination with uh, mental health providers to uh, try to do something better. First, let's define how divorce therapy is different than traditional couples therapy where the goal is to save the marital relationship. Obviously, in divorce therapy, it's the opposite. But tell us some of the major differences as you see them. Well, again, for the for the marriage and family therapist uh, uh, who's in practice, this is such a different territory than the usual territory of, of working with couples, right? Because working with couples in couple therapy, even with uh, difficult couples that are that are pretty entrenched, there is some force moving toward their being together. And uh, th- there is some sort of thread of hope or commitment or something that gives them uh, something that my colleague Bill Pinsoff would call a shared alliance about the couple therapy. We're supposed, to, we're hoping that something happens positive between us to make this better b- between us. In, in divorce therapy, the couples have quote unquote, decided to divorce, meaning it is clear we are getting a divorce. Now, there there always is a initiator in terms of that, and then somebody who is somewhat less so, right? So there, there are massive differences in people about how positive they feel about the idea of getting divorced, but there is pragmatic agreement that they are getting divorced and so then the task becomes to try to work toward the best outcome comes in terms of their not being together to do what a couple might best do to be able to move on with the remainder of their lives if they both agree they're getting divorced that is probably a good thing but what happens if one member of the couple has a secret hope that this therapy will be a marriage resusc- resuscitation effort yeah. and the other is clearly done what if they have a yeah. somewhat split agenda you you're reminding us that there there are that that just as in couple therapy different people come in the door with different uh, hopes and wishes in quote unquote divorce therapy people do that too as i was just saying it's certainly almost always the case that somebody is much more invested in getting divorced has taken the initiative to do that and the other person is somewhat less in, in, invested in that but then there are couples who wind up sort of in the in, they're far enough down the road Let's say some, one person has initiated divorce, we're in court, but there's still mixed agenda couples where the, the, the second part does not want to get divorced. And in that case, what do you do? Well, you, you have to make a, a, a bit of an a, a assessment, right? It's a complicated assessment because there are, you know, there's, a, there's the work of Bill Doherty, it's great great work, and Steve Harris on, on discernment counseling. Discernment counseling is about not divorce therapy, it's about taking these mixed agenda couples and trying to help, sort of help them sort. Are you trying to go this way or are you trying to go that way? I, I, I would say here as an aside, we're prob- probably really good at couple therapy. And if you follow the sorts of things I'm talking about today, can, you can be really good at divorce therapy. It's really hard to do both at the same time, right? The, it's very important for people to have a sense of, of the direction in which they are moving. So I was talking about assessment. As you're with people, if they are a, c- a couple who is uh, in this sort of mixed agenda, then it makes sense to either suggest to them disor- discernment counseling, or if you do discernment counseling, put that hat on, say we're suspending the divorce therapy, just like other discernment uh, therapy uh, therapists dis- suspend couple therapy, to, let's do discernment. 
But on the other hand, I do want to say that it's, this is a complicated assessment question because there are some people who, uh, no matter how much the one partner says, I am done, uh, they hold on to their strong conviction that they should stay married. So if this is a therapy in the United States, it's different in different parts of the world, but if there's a therapy in the United States, it only takes one person to get a divorce. The other person has no clout when you know i mean they, they could be a hundred percent committed the other the other party still is able to to obtain a divorce in the united states so if that's if you're working with that kind of couple yeah they're mixed agenda but they're that kind of couple that's about uh, trying to help the the partner who in, in uh, bill doherty's terms is still leaning in to figure out how to get with the agenda that is just the obvious agenda in front of us, which is that, yes, you may be very committed, but you're already a year and a half into a legal divorce process, and it clearly is uh, not helping anyone for you to, uh, you know, obstruct that process. Yes, and then so we've had Bill Doherty on the show, and the product of me of successful discernment counseling is, can you either go all in, or if you can't go all in, can you move towards a divorce? So let's say the another assessment item I would imagine, sometimes I've had a couple come to me where they have kind of decided on their own, that's where they at, and they have, they have sought no legal consultation yet. Other times, uh, MFTs will see couples that are already involved in a very nasty legal process, and then you get to them midstream. What do I need to know as far as assessing where they are in that divorce process, Jay? Well, one thing you do when you work with this population a lot is you get, you you really do get this sort of uh, sense of multiple perspectives on the world. People see things through uh, incredibly different lenses. They just they just do. And they convince themselves and they have a lot of data to back yeah, up their lens. right. That's... So, so uh, what, what, a piece of the angst of being a couple therapist is that you see couples who have really great relationships who decide to get divorced. Often it's like I met somebody new who was better, right, who I feel something more for or something. And then you see other couples who are just miserable with each other and are fully committed and they're going to stay married until they're 110, you know? No matter how uh, miserable they yeah. are. Yeah. Right? So to feed back to your question, which is about assessment, there's a piece of taking a look at where they are in the divorce process and putting your understanding of what's going on with them in the context of a developmental frame of what people go go through when they get divorced. It strikes me that in divorce therapy, every now and then, these are the best cases, I mean the best people to see, I'm about to describe, but they're few. Uh, Somebody will say, you know what, we just decided to get divorced, we want to really do this well. I want to, you know, we want to see you. We want to talk out like things like uh, parenting. And we want to talk out things like how we're going to relate to each other or whatever. Okay. But that is, you know, those are the best cases. They always go really well. On the other hand, the reality is most of the people who come for divorce therapy are people who've actually had a problem with getting divorced. They, the various tasks, their tasks you have to do to get divorced well enough, right? You know, well enough is the important phrase. It's not like another thing working with uh, this population a lot has, has, there's a, there are a lot of people who run into a lot of trouble. I mean, this is, uh, you know, in terms of the, the, where I started in terms of your question, just the different frames people have. We're talking about the rupture of what for most people in American society is the core attachment of their lives. Think of Sue Johnson's work about attachment. This is so important, so vital to all of us. Right. So that's why we can have, you know, people think of the divorce as just all-encompassing thing. But no, really, it's it's the legal divorce, and most people can do that. There's the financial part of the divorce, but there's the emotional part of the divorce that people, even if they work out all the other details, uh, haven't gotten to. Uh, it's like one of the problems uh, where uh, somebody always has post-traumatic stress, uh, always exaggeration, but most of the time, uh, you know, it's a, this is a, a, a real post-traumatic stress. And if it's if you're doing a bad enough divorce, I always say it's like it's like being in a war zone, except it's not that 
you know, Saddam Hussein is dropping bombs on you. It's the person that you fell closest to in your life who's now dropping bombs on you. It, uh, so your question was about assessment. Couples like they need structure and they have an idea. Even if you have the best divorce, you always end up thinking your partner got a better deal and you felt somewhat uh, like you got the short end of the stick. So when you're trying to lay out structure for couples like this that are usually highly conflictual, not like the first example that you gave, have a hard time following even a judge's instructions. How do you lay upon structure around communication, around what to do and what not to do with a couple like this in the middle of a messy divorce? Yeah, I think these are situations in which you need to establish a good working alliance with both parties. You got to listen to them. Having said that, in the first few meetings, it's just so important, and then after that as well, but especially at the front end, to establish that the therapist is in charge of the process, and the therapist is going to going to make sure that it's a safe environment for for all the parties. And I don't here. I don't just mean physical safeness. I also mean that that the therapist has to engage in in various therapeutic operations to establish that they're in charge and to contain conflict when it occurs. I, I often say to people in, in when they get into the uh, knee jerk conflicts, look, this is why this is why you sort of have to be here because of these conflicts and to just go on with them in the way that they do kind of on the front lawn or in the house you know really serves no purpose we talk about this idea of of course you need to listen but in listening whereas your alliance it's more easily framed as my alliance is with the couple in a couple or family therapy where the job is to preserve the relationship in this one split alliances are almost expected in the sense that one partner is trying to get the therapist to see it their way but really you cannot be kind of judge or jury how do you frame to a couple what your role is in order to minimize the chances of these split alliances coming up you try to set a frame with them of where you're trying to go and you make it clear to them that you know that they have all sorts of pain and hurt and that's really important we got to we have to know that but we're trying to accomplish some tasks. We're trying to make it so this can be the least harmful and painful it can be. That's what we're trying to do. And at the end of the day, you can move on with your respective lives, whether you have children or not, with the most integrity and respect right. for each other. And, and accomplish the task. There are tasks in divorce. You just named one, right? If you have children, you have the task of trying to figure out how to co-parent them right and there are various tasks for as well for people who don't have children right there's various tasks we have to do how do we accomplish the these tasks and in most of the population i'm talking about this is not subtle they're not accomplishing these tasks they're mired in quicksand and everybody feels stuck and and you try to help them refocus on what actually might be beneficial like for example for their children to do well or for them to be able to move on with their lives and try to keep that in focus because it's so easy for that to get out of focus when somebody left the car in front of somebody else's car. Yeah, so let's talk about more about that structure and rules you place on that. So I think one of it is what to do and what also what not to do. So not only are we not trying to revive the marriage, how do you help a couple as far as bringing up these things for the past that is not going to help them in moving forward? Because I think that is a common thing. Many young therapists working with divorcing couples, they don't know how to steer it out of that zone when it starts talking and rehashing the past over and over. Divorce is a big event in people's lives. And it's an event where, in the best case, you really uh, take stock of your life and you revisit things that have happened and you do something with your pain, okay? So so I think in the best case of divorce therapy is, uh, because we've been talking about like you're meeting with the couple and they're getting divorced. 
Divorce therapy is a uh, sort of it's the it's it's the work with the largest system to try to help this process along. But good divorce therapy might often say to the the uh, one of the parents, "You need to see my colleague, uh, who uh, you know individually, and, and and talk with them about these you know these uh, these hurts you are experiencing." Or in the work I do, I will often have individual meetings with people. If if, if, if we're not talking about now um, uh, the same level of work that can get done in, in a somebody really commits to a therapy for a while for themselves, but. Uh, but to at least work some with uh, with these issues. Huh? Okay, so you're reading my mind. So this, this next question is about the kind of systemic staging of a work like this. So in traditional couples therapy, unless there's some reason clinically indicated to not do it, you would always meet with the couple together. So in divorce therapy, talk about the staging. Would you always meet with the divorcing couple together? Would you break it up into individual meetings in order to build those alliances or get some buy-in? And then if this person needed really individual work to deal with their own wound or pain, would you do that or would you refer that out? There's a lot of questions we get about the staging. And if you're if the systemic therapist and MFT, can you do it under one umbrella or should you have some collaboration? Yeah. The essential work in the cases I'm talking about is the work you do together. Okay. That's really essential. And here we're talking about more of the, you know, behavioral, cognitive, structural, the, the pieces that have to do with uh, establishing good enough communication good enough problem solving, good enough we leave each other alone, okay? So those, those like, that's essential. Uh, then uh, I think uh, there, there are two ways that individual work gets brought into this. One is, as I said, I mean, I would say to everybody who's getting divorced, good time to go talk with something. Something really big just went on in your life. Maybe, maybe will help. It probably certainly would help you to go on and figure out what just happened and how you might do this better okay the the second way is that look you know i mean you can only do so much there are certain kinds of work you just cannot do in the presence of a hostile soon to be former spouse okay and that might work maybe uh, really the essential ingredient for a person, right? So, for example, if, if my issue is my deep hurt, and that's why I am not moving my car when it's blocking yours, uh, we can, you know, we can negotiate forever about where cars are going to be, but um, uh, it, it sure will be more effective to get to, you know, for, for someone to get to the pain that the person's experiencing and uh, and what's going on there. And, and here's a way that the divorce therapy is very different than couple therapy. You can do, there are many models, uh, Bowen therapy, and uh, certainly one of them, uh, EFT, for, for doing deep emotional work with clients in the presence of their partner. You cannot do that in divorce therapy. <laughs> No, you're not going to show your vulnerability and take no, the wall, it's, it's, brick of your wall it, down when somebody's going to hit you with the brick. It, right? Exactly. It, it is an uh, experience of your experience, your pain, and watching your, your former partner be indifferent uh, is, no, it's, a, it's not, not, a, not a safe experience. So in, in any case, so that's, you know, so you get stuck and you're doing, you know, you've got some nice plan for communication and one person cannot do the communication because something is getting in their way. Well, that that's a place to either meet individually with them, or you might even, you know, you know that uh, I have a colleague, and and for that work to get done with a colleague. But let can I can I go on, on one digression here? Uh, the worst there are things that go really badly in these cases, right? I mean, because for the horror the horror stories people have. Uh, marriage and family therapists have about seeing these cases are are legion, right? They're just all, so many. These are the cases in which triangulation is everywhere. They just it is, right? So, going back to this idea of, of 
of seeing the couple together and then there being other therapists involved, whether we're, we've been talking so far about uh, individual therapists for uh, uh, each partner, huh? but you could also talk about uh, individual therapists for children, almost always a horror story when there are multiple therapists and they are not coordinating with each other. Because that same story that sits in the couple therapy as George is uh, really way off and full of anger and, and belligerent and whatever, easily becomes for an, a disconnected individual therapist as, oh my goodness, your, 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 your wife did what? becomes an isomorphic process, a parallel process with the treatment team. And that we talk about a split alliance. Uh, it's a very split treatment team alliance right. too. Yeah. Yes, yeah, absolutely. So you have to, in the, in, in, in the way of doing this that I put forth, it, it, you're, you're always talking about somebody sort of taking a coordination function to make sure that all the therapists are talking to all the other therapists because in that way we all stay on the same page. Therapists mostly want the same positive outcomes, right? It's just a matter of getting them to understand the multiple perspectives. I think also another thing going along with that, it's great if you're at a place like the Family Institute at, at Northwestern University where you have a, a lot of clinicians to collaborate or if you're at a co-empty training program. Uh, but if uh, if you don't, it still behooves you to get the release to talk. And at least initially back at that assessment phase, you got to ask. I think so many young therapists make mistakes or inexperienced in this type of work because they don't ask who you've seen before, who are the players in the system, and then you get hit with some big headaches if you don't ask those no, questions. That's right. You. And, and, and even, uh, even people in, uh, in private practice form these little networks, informal networks, of, uh, okay, you know, I, I, I work with this population, and I know these other people who work with this population, and I'm going to refer my individual, my, my individual, individual in my therapy, therapy to this person, and we have a good working relationship. So when you can do it up front that way, it's much, it's much easier, right? When you, you have relationships and you can, with the other therapist and, and, and the conversation uh, come, comes most ready. But on the other hand, most situations you don't have that. In most situations you are, you know, then left to kind of reach out and talk to somebody you don't know, and talk to you know, and and try to try to see if there can be uh, good enough coordination. So when we talk about coordination, let's also talk, you're talking about larger systems. So let's talk about the legal system. Many therapists, their worst nightmare, and I'll own this. I don't want to. I've been doing this for almost two decades now, and I do not want to go to court. Uh, that is the last thing that I want to do, and it's very hard for me to go into a therapy and to be an agent of change thinking that somebody is going to use me, a client, in some kind of a court manipulation. So talk about interfacing with the legal system and how that works and how you, as a MFT working with highly conflictual divorcing couples, have to navigate that territory. So the answer to this question starts with a paradox. And the paradox is that one actually almost never gets called to testify in these cases. That's just true. There are a bunch of reasons that's true. And, uh, and if you handle the interface you have with lawyers and, uh, and the court well, you can even uh, drive that down, that frequency down to very, very microscopic chance you'll be involved. On the other hand, the other side of the paradox is that it's essential to know about the legal system, to know about the legal system in these cases, and to feel a mastery of, of these various legal settings. Yes, and one of the experiences you have when you are uh, learning to work with these cases is just, you, you just learn how different the legal system than is the uh, you know than is the therapy world right now in the legal system m make sure to say this because it, it often gets mischaracterized the the courts that see these people 
want them to resolve their problems. They're, they're just as, uh, they, they may be more adamant about them, you know, because it's, it's a very decisive system, right? So they may be more adamant about them working out their things than a therapist would be. You know, therapists are often more accepting of a range of outcomes. Having said that, the legal system is a, is a, is a, is a system based on conflict. What, what everybody sees when you uh, watch the TV shows about uh, prosecutors and defense attorneys. You know, in that world, uh, there is lots of challenge, uh, there, there's lots of threat, and uh, there even are some, uh, uh, it's not the majority of practitioners, but some who uh, uh, are, are conflict engendering rather than conflict uh, resolving. So, it, you have to learn as a therapist who are the party who's in that system who are the people you can work with uh, that's at a structural level like what's a judge do what's a what's an attorney for children do uh, so on but you got to learn about the people the, the specific people you got to learn you know who this person is and that person is and how to, how to how to work best with them it really is a, a place where you need to learn to work with with uh, systems. Yes. Now, how does someone, if if they didn't get this training in their graduate program, so clearly it is within the scope of an MFT's practice to do divorce therapy. Had, however, may not be in their scope of competence until they get the experience doing it. So, you have been in this field for over four decades. You were, as you said, in the infancy of doing this work when the divorce rate spiked in the early 80s. Where do I go if I'm an MFT listening to this podcast to get more information in the kind of training that I need to work and learn these systems and work with these couples? Number one, uh, you seek out training. Uh, materials, you know, like workshops, weekend trainings, or whatever, in in work with these uh, populations. There are. I, I have a, a book called uh, Treating the High Conflict Divorce. You read books of that that kind, right? So you 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 learn. There are um, uh, many materials that have been circulated by a um, a group called AFCC. It's the Conciliation Court. Um, it's a that's a interdisciplinary group of uh, judges, lawyers, and mental health professionals that put out guidelines for this kind of work. So you learn about those things. Then you have to go get mentored. I, I don't think you learn how to do this on your own. Yeah, I think you need supervision, specific supervision with somebody. You know, you go go as you would in any specialization. You go, uh, you know, find somebody in your community who does this sort of work, and you meet well, with them. This is where I'll, I'll tell a personal story. So Jay was one of my original mentors at the Family Institute almost 19 years ago now. So I was Jay would get a lot of these cases, and it would be a team of therapists work working with the couple. In this case, uh, we were working with, with the child, but that's how you learn. You learn by working with other people that do the work. A nice thing about these cases for training is that, as I you know, where it was emphasizing a bit ago, uh, these, these are often cases where there are multiple pieces of the case, right? So uh, as you're learning, you would uh, begin with, you know, the work with one of the, the partners with uh, the supervisor working with uh, the system. And so, you know, if, if that if was in that sort of way, you have the common ground of the case, you're learning about the case, but you also are then learning what the supervisor's doing in the in the larger context. It's also how you model for the couple, uh, again, another parallel process, how to have the right communication and how to stay on the same page. Another question we get asked a lot and goes right with what we're talking about now is the type of self of therapist and kind of personal attributes you need to do this work. Obviously, I don't think you can work with couples or families. I always tell my students, unless you have somewhere either on the surface or deep down in you, a directive part of your personality. But working with these high-conflict couples, I, I would imagine, well, I know you have to really have that part front and center. What, what do you think uh, the therapist factors are, Jay, involved in being successful in couples like this? Yeah, I, you know, I have, I have seen uh, uh, several of my senior colleagues who were just not cut out for this work right you, you you they're too they nice wind, they wind <laughs> up with one of these cases and they do exactly they do beautifully with 
with a, a, other, a, a wide range of other couples, it does take a special, uh, some special self of the therapist characteristics. I think uh, you got to be able to differentiate yourself from the family. Uh, you, you are sitting, I, 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 as I put it earlier, you're sitting in a war zone often. Okay, there's a certain interface there about how you deal with that, huh? Right, about how you hold it and how you uh, manage it in inside you without it causing you to be um, demoralized or too upset with them or whatever it might be. Um, hope you got to, you have to have a, a lot of hope here. You have to be able. It's a paradox here. You have to be able to see through the pain. And keep a developmental framework here. Like the best of couples often have difficulties in some way in terms of this very difficult process of separating and divorcing, right? So you have to be able to, you know, to to imagine uh, them not at their worst, but uh, like in some process of moving ahead. And then, as you said, you have to be uh, able to be highly structuring when you need to. And you have to have a skill set that goes with that. I mean, you know, that combination, uh, I think, puts one in, in, a, in a position to, uh, to go in and, and, and be a, a positive force in helping people move along. Um, I don't know if it's an inner, exactly an interface ish, issue, but it is certainly essential. It, it falls in the ballpark. You got to be able to set realistic goals here. I, I always say that it's like we're trying. If if we are talking about the most difficult divorce, we're talking about just trying to get people to do the this a bit better so that there is less damage. Some people are more able to. Uh, be it by virtue of their personalities to get in that territory. Other people are more, uh, you know, are just harder scaling back goals. And I think, think also uh, after reflecting on back what we've said so far this hour, I think another quality uh, that you need to have in addition to being hopeful is that you have to find is someone that finds the buy-in. So we could do a whole different podcast on having kind of a limited partnership in the best interest of the children. But sometimes there is nothing that unites them except they both want their children to succeed. And they realize after time and money and frustration that the way they're doing it isn't working. They might not agree how the partner, they might not, not know the right way to do it, but they agree that their child is important. So that is a buy-in I often use. I also think the goal of the therapy uh, is to divorce, but they still want to focus on inflicting the same pain and suffering on their partner, their ex that they had, that won't work either. So eventually people realize that they need to move on. In order to move on, they have to have some structure in their current relationship with their ex. And then there's some relationships where part of the the, the work is moving to where they won't have contact, especially if they don't have children. And that's hard for some people too, that even if they're not staying married, still are somewhat, as you, we were talking about earlier, emotionally tied. How do you know when divorce therapy is over, Jay? Well, that's a, re- a really tough question. It's because it, it's it, for the majority of the cases we're talking about today, which are these difficult divorce cases, right? I mean, that's the the answer might be different with a couple who are you know in that mode of I just want to kind of work on my divorce and you know get this to be better, but uh, but in those difficult cases I think uh, it's when you feel like you've reached sort of maximum benefit, uh, and uh, and and that in the form of getting uh, some. Uh, separation, getting some level of better behavioral compliance with the things that need to be done, sort of uh, moving out of each other's lives, good enough communication that is like uh, manageable, (laughs) right? So basically they've internalized the, the structure of the therapy and the meta rules for communicating that they can do it on their own and they don't need you in the same capacity. I'm actually uh, saying that in a little different way. If we're talking about really difficult divorce, uh, it's it, it, my experience is that it's just not. If you made a checklist of they were, you know, 
really good communication or <laughs> whatever for, you'd be with these people forever i mean and 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 it's time limited this work always is time limited so i i think it's getting it good enough getting it good enough so that there isn't like i we can expect there are going to be problems in communication we get across to each other at least the most important things so we don't have too many of the conflicts that come up about communication. That, that it's sort of like, it, I'm going to use the word acceptance. It's not actually accepting because it's not, <laughs> if you ask, I think if you ask people at the end of this process, did they really accept what their partner was doing? No, they would still complain about what their partner was doing. But it's, it's like, a, 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 like, okay, yeah, we got this to move along. Where, number one, we are now divorced, a very important thing to accomplish. We're not going back in court about matters, okay, because we're f at least figuring out some way to live our lives. And we've uh, at least erected uh, enough of a parallel, uh, something about parallel lives, and enough of an interface with each other to not make this too terrible for everybody. Uh, so the, uh, my, my point is that those are what might sound like mo sound like modest goals, but they it does take a lot of work to get to that point. And those are the type of goals, if you hit those, another outcome I look at is uh, lack of further legal or court action or intervention. So if they can do it good enough and resolve it on their own, it stops all the headaches uh, associated with the legal system. And the, and the legal system, let's remember that in a lot of these cases, the legal system is, is, is making the referral. They're a party to the case. They're not actively, you know, they're not the client in a, in a legal meaning of client, but they're, they're a real party to the case. And the legal system does not want these people hanging around and, and uh, continuing to relitigate. It does not. Last question. You, have, in the last 40 years, have been such a purveyor of the field of couple and family therapy in general. As I said, the editor of Family Process, one of your legacies will be kind of moving the field uh, as far as empirically supported treatments and commenting on those and documenting those. What do we know as far as about evidence-based treatment in the in for these divorcing couples well it's a that's a really uh interesting question because by, by virtue of the fact that a lot of these people are in litigation you know you have to sign off on permissions for research or whatever there have been very little uh, there have been been very little research about various treatment approaches with this uh with this problem very little research there has been a considerable research on divorcing people and high conflict divorcing people, and we know a bunch of things about that. So, uh, so I believe th that it's very important to use the evidence that we have to inform this practice, even though there aren't the kinds of studies that there might be, say, on couple therapy, where we can we can know that uh, EFT done with 50 couples in a randomized clinical trial worked, right? We don't have that. So how do you do that? You do that by, uh, number one, using the methods that have been demonstrated to work in other similar populations. There's a lot of work, for example, on a lot of, lot of uh, research on how to work with high conflict. There's a lot of work on how uh, research on how to work with with a, the kind of affect uh, dysregulation that a lot of the folks uh, I'm talking about have. And there's a lot of information about divorcing families and the processes in divorcing families and whatever. Uh, a lot of research information that readily can get incorporated into practice. So. It's, so evidence is really important, but it's not as if somebody next week is going to do a, a research study that's going to show that a particular treatment is going to be highly effective with this population. Instead, it's to, to have the methods that are used be consistent with what we know about these families and we, we know about the kinds of problems that they manifest. 
Well said, my friend. I can't thank you enough for being with us on the AAMFT podcast today. Tell us one more time the book, Jay, because I I do have it. And I will say that as far as kind of a handbook on how to work with these type of couples, including everything that we talked about today and then some, it's got it in there. So tell us about the book one more time and uh, I will, uh, will certainly pass on any other resources that you think are helpful. Yeah. It's called Trading the Difficult Divorce, and it's published by uh, APA Books, and it came out just uh, this year. Brand new. Thank you so much, Jay. It's been a pleasure. Okay. Thank you. There you have it. Bringing to a close another successful installment of the AMFT podcast, where we relate, educate, and innovate one episode at a time. I learned a lot from Jay talking about the challenges of working with difficult couples going through divorce. And as we learned in that episode, some are more challenging than others. The book is a great help. I'll mention one more time. It's Treating the Difficult Divorce, a practical guide for psychotherapists that came out from APA. You can get it in hard copy or if you like to read on your e-reader or Kindle, pull an Amazon Kindle, wherever you get your favorite psychotherapy books, table of contents, I'll just tell you a little. There's interventions with divorce, there's structuring treatment, specific treatment strategies, interacting with the legal system, and special challenges from difficult divorces, and the therapist's own interface issues with difficult divorces, plus plenty of relevant case examples. Jay could easily come back and be the subject of one of our pioneer interviews. He's really done it all in the field. I think somebody that is associated with integration and just a purveyor of what works in psychotherapy. Nobody better today still around and kicking than Jay LeBeau. Thank you so much, Jay. Follow us on Twitter. AMFT is at the AMFT. I'm at Dr. Eli Live keep the conversation going. I love hearing from listeners. Lately, I've been getting a lot of feedback, both supportive comments on the show and what you'd like to see coming up, both interviews and guests and content areas. And I appreciate both of those. The easiest way to get a hold of me is info at elikaram.com. I-N-F-O at E-L-I-K-A-R-A-M.com. You can drop the AMFT line at communications at aamft.org. We love hearing from you. Until next time, my friends, stay systemic.